Jason, um, you know, it, it, I introduced you as, you know, the president and founder of Hollywood Unlocked and a media mogul and just all of the things that you do in the entertainment world. Um, but over the last year or so, he's become someone that I'm close with, have a tremendous amount of respect for. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Now, Jason, every, every person that's been here so far, you're the, you're the closing interview. I've, I mean, I've, you always say Beyonce for last, so. <laughs> <laughs> so is that is you Beyonce? I'm the Beyonce of the, of the internet. Yeah, I mean, I, I run the world. That's, that's my thing. I think that's actually true. Uh, but I've told them all, I brought you here to ask you one question in front of these people. Um, and I've told you this many times, you have the strongest ability to manifest your reality of anyone I've ever met. And the question I wanna ask you is, if you read his book, within literally the first three pages, you read about the first time you witnessed a murder. Mm -hmm. And you grew up in Stockton, California, in the foster care system, and experienced lots of really hard things. How did you develop the ability to become the Jason Lee we see today that is as successful as you are in the business and entertainment world, as true and solid as to who you are as a person? Like, how do you start there and get here? Every time he asks that, I laugh because I don't know any other choice. Like, I grew up, like you say, in the foster care system. For me, it's survival. Like, how do you survive? like stranger care how do you survive going to a school with not knowing people and not knowing like they're going home to their families you're going home to a group of people that are paid to manage you like for me it was always about survival so uh, starting with my mom who's on drugs um, as she gradually got deeper into drugs i started seeing like our world started changing so every you know we had a well-furnished house and then the furniture starts leaving, and then the Christmas is the, the Christmases are there, and then Christmas start going away. And now you're in a motel. And now you're in a foster care. So like, for me, as things started changing around me, I just initially just knew that survival was something that I had to figure out. So um, just over the, the course of my life, I've just gone through so many different things. I think it was like when my brother died at 19, I, I saw him get murdered. That was, I think, like the worst thing that I could experience because you know go to foster care yeah you miss your family but you can still get on the phone you can still see him there's still visitation so they're still there but when you're hanging out with somebody that you love the most and then they get taken from you without you planning that and having to process all of that in real time and all of that um, to me that was like rock bottom so I didn't really feel like anything else in my mind I just started switching my mind so I already went through the worst so no matter what happens now lose a job lose a relationship lose a friend lose an opportunity or whatever I've already lost the worst thing so um, again, started kicking into, um, you know, the whole idea that I had to figure out survival. So when people say, oh, I can't believe, I think one of our first sessions, you said, um, somebody like you should be either on drugs in prison or dead. I was like, damn, that was kind of brutal. <laughs> um, but I, I've worked, um, on the other side of it. I became a probation officer thinking like helping kids who are like me would be, that's the way. And then I realized that like, um, you know, slavery, Jim Crow, prison systems, there's like a thread between all of that and that really wasn't designed to help people that look like me, so I left that. Um, and uh, then I became a union leader, started working in unions to help people. Um, and then they shifted their priorities and I realized working for somebody just didn't make sense because how do you survive in stuff that you just can't control? So I started my own business so I can control my own world. So when people say, oh, I, I don't know why you um, aren't in this way. Um, I've had every example of why I don't want to be that. Mom was a drug crackhead, don't want to be that. Dad was an absent father, don't want to have kids if I'm not ready to raise them right. I've had all the examples of what not to be, so like to become that would be crazy. But, and the reason I ask you that, and will continue to ask you that, is because you were, I'll put it in some context, right? This is a room full of psychotherapists, there's some on Zoom, lots on Zoom, and um, one of the things therapists have such a hard time doing is like believing in their clients when clients come to see them. And did you tell them how we met? No, don't tell them. Are you gonna tell them? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. So, so, Char so Charlemagne is a friend of mine, uh, Charlemagne the God from Breakfast Club. And every time he would see me, he would say, you need to get therapy. And I, I was like, 
that's fucking disrespectful. You know what I mean? Like, don't project your issues on me, you know? Because every time he would see me, and if you watch one of the last Breakfast Clubs I just hosted a couple weeks ago, maybe a week ago. Like, like, yeah, a few days ago. Yeah, a few days ago. Somebody called in, and the caller was like, oh, I have a question for Jason. And I was literally ready to just tear his ass up. And Charlemagne was like, yo, relax. Like, why are you ready? And then I said, because I, I, I always have to be prepared. And the guy was really nice, and then he went for me. And I said, see, that's why I see y'all are weak. Y'all don't want to be ready, and that's why you get taken down. I'm going to always be ready. But I say that to say, he would always say to me, like, you need therapy. Then here comes Tiffany Haddish. She's a friend of mine. She said, oh, um, you, should, you should talk to my therapist. I'm like, yo, I don't know what's going on, but, like, I'm not trying to be in therapy. Like, I got my own way of dealing with stuff. And I do not family, want him to finish this story. I just want to make that very My way clear. of dealing with shit, like, I, I, when my brother got murdered, I didn't even know I had, like when I said earlier, I saw my mom as a drug addict, crackhead, didn't want to be that. I had um, started replacing like the pain with alcohol. Mm -hmm. So like I would work all day, party all night. It's just partying, but like we're getting trash. Pass out and then go to work the next day. So for me, I wasn't alcoholic because I was functional. I was, I could still run the business. I could still, work in my job, I could do it all. Um, I still had all my faculties. I was still a sharp, whatever, but I was partying and I was just a party person. And, so I did that from like 19 until um, like 46, <laughs> so like 45. So Tiffany, she's like, yo, maybe you should like, you know, talk to a therapist or whatever. I'm like, nah, I'm cool. Come to find out they both are in cahoots because they both have the same therapist. But I'm like, okay, if they both have a therapist that they trust, maybe I'll meet them. One day I'll meet them, whatever. So one day I'm at a party with Tiffany and she says, oh, I had some people join us. I got a sprinter. I'm like, okay, we're going to go to the Abbey. This is a gay club. It's, it's like hell. We're going to hell. Wait, can I pause you? I'm going to interject something yes. real quick. Tiffany texts me. She's like, we're at this address, Uber here. So I take an Uber there. And a sprinter, I didn't know, I didn't know what a sprinter was, but it's like a private jet on wheels. And there's Jason, and he's the coolest dude ever. It's nighttime. He's got sunglasses on. Mm -hmm. He's just sitting there. He barely even looks at me. I sit in the sprint, I'm just looking at Tiffany. And Jason turns to Tiffany and, he, and says, did you tell him where we're going? And Tiffany says, no. And the first words he ever said to me ever, Tiffany says, no. He turns to me and he goes, we're going to hell. <laughs> Facts. And so driver, drive us to hell. So we, went, <laughs> we, we go to the Abbey. The Abbey, for those of you that know, is the world's most famous gay and lesbian bar. There's strippers everywhere on poles, flying across half naked. We're, we got bottles, we're getting drunk. And he, the therapist is sitting there. I didn't know he was a therapist. So uh, we got really trashed that night. We had a good time. He exited. It was definitely in the a venue he had probably never been to in his life, never but, experienced that. OK, I'm going to pause you again. i got to interject what arriving at a club is like with Jason Lee. We, he says, driver takes us to hell, brings us to the Abbey. They open, and there's literally a red carpet that lets us out, takes us to our section, escorted by naked people. <laughs> In the club, I saw, I saw things that I wasn't prepared to see. Yeah, well, it was normal. And Jason's just like, just. But, but I think for me, <laughs> you, you know, like, like the thing I love about, like, me, and this is why I will say, like, there were times where I would never say things I like about me, because, well, I mean, self-love was the journey that Tiffany started me on, and, you know, she would always say, oh, I love you, and I'd be like, eh, I don't want to hear all that, and then I, then I would hang up on her, and then I would have to force myself to call her back to say it, because you're supposed to tell people you love them when they tell you that they love you, and then it just naturally became a thing where, like, now it's not as much of a thing. Well, the thing I love most about me is I don't care if I'm talking to the vice president of the United States or I'm talking to a stripper, a transgender person, a homeless person, a drug addict, a blood crip, a kid. Like, you're going to always get me. Like, that's just, that's just who I am. It's, I don't have the time or, in, like, the, I don't have the privilege of trying to figure out how to. Now, I can code switch. There's a difference between code switching for me and then, like, switching up. Um, I don't. I don't have the uh, the need to like define who I am for anybody that can't digest me. Like I, this is what it is. And if you can't digest me, then God did not put me in your life to be around you, and you in my life to be around me. And I'm not apologetic about that. Um, and so it was good that he was able to see it because I always thought that going to therapy was about facing judgment. Um, so being able to have somebody come in and see my world, like see it, not, not me like come, you know, he's been to my award show, he's been to this, he's been to that, but like to come see, this is how I am in my social time. I'm not thinking about a therapist, I'm not thinking about a restriction, I'm not thinking about performing, I'm just being me. And then when we had our first session, I think he said something like, 
there's nothing wrong with you. I'm like, well, that's what people go to therapy for because there's something wrong with them. But I, that was able to help me let my guard down and just be like, okay, well, here's all the different layers. And, and I think at the time, um, I wasn't trying to stop drinking. I just said, oh, maybe I should stop, drink less. Because <laughs> um, I was spending like $50,000 a month on alcohol, like it, partying, clubbing, and, and to, this and to that. pause you for a second, he just used an example where he said, you get me, which I actually want to talk about, like how you learn to be so solid in your truth and authenticity. But he said, you get me, whether you're a stripper or this or that or the vice president. He means that literally. Like I've been talking to him and he'll say, hold on one second, this is the White House. Literally. These are the people that are calling him that he is calling. He's and not strippers call me too. I got, a call. <laughs> I got a call yesterday from a stripper who don't speak English. So we talked through a translate app. But, but this but is I'm not. I'm just saying like my, my Rolodex is vast. It's, the, this know. is not a euphemism. He literally <laughs> will say, sorry, Elliot, I'm getting a call from the White House. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> I've never heard these things come out of person mouth before. But it's a literal thing for him. So the journey about like learning to live in my truth and in my space and accepting maybe there's nothing wrong with me, this man has lived it in the most extreme circumstances because most people don't have that vast of an experience of who they would talk to in a given day. He does. But you're also talking about like an industry in a city that's like make believe, like Hollywood is not real. LA is, I mean, LA is a great city um, for many reasons, but like a lot of people come here to find fame and lose themselves. And I, I, I mean, I, I was on that track too. But um, I think like just I know who I am at the core as a person, and I know that like I lead with intention, um, and I and I and sometimes you know I, I struggle between like being misunderstood, but also understanding that like I've only shown parts of myself too. So in building my business, I was very much focused on saying what I felt in the most extreme way that shocked the hell out of people and made people uncomfortable. That was the brand that I started. That's the brand that I built, and that's what people reacted to the most. So that when I saw that, that's what people wanted. I just kept feeding them that, feeding them that. In the world of cancel culture where everybody's afraid to be honest or to hurt people's feelings or uh, to say whatever people are thinking, I just felt like, damn, if real is rare right now, let me just put it to like the max. And and I would be uncomfortable, I would not be uncomfortable, but I would walk in a room and I would, there would be rooms I'd walk in and I'd feel like just the air suck out of the room like when I walk in. And I would find humor in that, you know? <laughs> which is kind of sick when I think about it. But then now, like, I know when I walk in a room now, I know that even if there are different perceptions of who I am, because I've evolved and I've started showing more layers to me, that I know when I walk in now, like, I know there's respect. I know people will respect me for what I've built. And I respect, like, the fact that I went from a person who didn't have a home, a person who didn't have family with them, a person who had lost some of the closest people to him, been shot, molested, all these different things, can say it freely without fear of judgment um, and then also can say like I've also figured out the other side of you know pursuing my dreams and getting past the fear of um, leaving a job and not pursuing my passion and, and I, you know I figured it out how hell <laughs> um, how did you figure that I out I think the one the one thing that I will say is that I wrote in my book that I learned is that in life you have to live with um, it's faith over fear so I used to get on planes and be afraid I was gonna die well, who wants to do things where they think they're going to die? Yeah, there's a chance a plane could fall out the sky. I mean, but, you know, the reality is if you look in America, not many planes have fallen out the sky. Not, you know, not many, but there have been some. So I started just going, okay, I'm going to start focusing on my faith instead of fear. I'm going to put faith over fear. When I had a job and I wanted to start my career, I didn't have the faith that I could do it because I was afraid, like, because literally I'm in a business where you eat, where you, you eat what you kill. <clears throat> and so to start to leave a job where I was making 5000 every other week, which to me from coming from nothing was I was rich. Yeah, I mean, I have a Mercedes, I have the cheapest Mercedes Benz at the time, but I still Mercedes. What about that watch? What this watch? <laughs> Light work, you know, <laughs> but um, but, you know, it's real, too, by the way, um, <laughs> because there were days I didn't have the real watch, you know, I mean, the make it till you fake it thing, whatever. Um, but no, I mean, I. Uh, I just, I knew I said, okay, I was faced with the choice of like staying in my career and lying to people um, because that's what they wanted me to do or leave my job without a plan and just figure it out. So I left and I figured it out. I mean, it was a journey, but it was hard. Um, and that's why like nowadays with this newer generation, everybody wants this microwavable success. They want it right now. Social media, I want the car right now. I want this right now. I want that. Um, nah, 
And Floyd, I, I credited Floyd Mayweather this at my award show. He said to me, he said, because um, I called him one day and said, oh, I want this. I, want, I was living in a studio apartment and I had a Dodge Challenger with expired tags. I had just started my business. I had no money. I was 323 pounds at the time. Um, and, but I was really focused on, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. He said, listen, you're going to get all the things you want, the watch, the jewelry, the cars, the house. You're going to get all the money. You're going to get everything you want. You're going to become the Floyd Mayweather of media, but it's not going to make you happy. It's not going to change anything about how you feel right now, just so you know that. And I remember being, I, I felt insulted because I'm like, <laughs> this is a, a billionaire telling me this. And I got off the phone, probably talked shit about him. Um, and then, you know, one day I got it all. I mean, I don't have the billion yet, but, you know, a billion wasn't even a goal. But after you reach multi-millions, you're like, okay, I want to be a billionaire. Um, it didn't change anything. In fact, it added more stresses that I didn't have before because now friends started changing. Um, you know, family started treating me like a celebrity and not a person. Um, you know, people start creating narratives about me. One lady, I'll just say this really quick. I, I, I low-key want to strangle her, but I'm in therapy. <laughs> you know, I'm openly gay. I love being gay. I take pride in being gay. I, I just, I'm so, I couldn't, I wouldn't even know what being straight would feel like at this point. And I, shout out to everybody who's been through divorces. We don't have those issues at your rate yet because we just barely got the right to get married. Um, but I remember this YouTuber going online and saying, oh yeah, Jason lost all that weight. He might have dirty blood. Basically saying I have HIV. Um, now the old Jason, the things I would have done to that person, I would have had my investigator find her address. I would have sent her flowers with a necklace camera on it so she know I saw her. Like, I mean, I would have did so many things. <laughs> Um, on top of going online and putting her ugly children on there, right? But I did it, because I'm in therapy. I'm in therapy. <laughs> she do got some ugly kids, though, I'm just saying. But I don't attack people's children, because that's not nice, but I'm in a safe space. Hey, everybody watch this. <laughs> you know, and she know who she is. But anyway, um, I, didn't, I didn't attack her children or her or anything. You know, but it's one of those things where, like, I don't have to defend what isn't true. Like, I, I, we work in a world online where there's people who aren't in the room who are going to have judgments, who are going to have takeaways, who are going to believe whatever they believe. I don't own none of that. I learned in my own journey that, like, I own what I do and who I am, but I don't own how people digest that and what they perceive, and whatever they want to control it, say about me. And, and it, you know, more, first I want to sue everybody that has something to say. Then I'm like, well... I'm not going to do that because I start getting sued by a whole bunch of people for nothing. So, yeah, it's just one of those things where, I mean, the journey of finding the faith of making it through and um, finding my way has just been something that I've had to just figure out. So, uh, two things. First, I want to talk about your authenticity. And second, I want to talk about. Yeah, like ranking. nobody would come up here and say somebody has ugly children. No. To the room full of si They're all judging me right now. You know what I mean? Yes. No, I'm playing. I'm playing. I know, I know. <laughs> No, no, but, but, no but, but seriously, they are ugly. And but, but the thing is, <laughs> I, I, I'm, people, you know how people will say like, oh, look at my baby. You know, I hate when people do that to me. I, I try to, anytime somebody bring a kid around me, I literally try to get out the room because if you say to me, look at little Sue, she's cute, right? Now, you know damn well Sue is not cute. <laughs> but you want me to reaffirm a lie. I'm not going to do that. I'll just say that's a cute outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Sue, got, Sue got some nice shoes on, but hey, get Sue out of here. What, does, <laughs> what do I ask at this point? How did you learn to live in your truth to the degree to which you do? Now, and I, the reason that's important, because as therapists, we work with clients that are oftentimes afraid to live in their truth because they're afraid about the feedback they're going to get from their family, from their partner, from whatever. But you live in this truth and you get feedback. I mean, anything he does goes viral, mm -hmm. anything. So the feedback loop he gets is from the whole world, but there's a strength and like a solidness in who you know you are. Mm -hmm. And we got to help our clients get there. How did how did you develop? I mean, that? it don't mean it doesn't mean that it still doesn't hurt. I'll give you a clear example. But I'm super petty, right? <laughs> I'm super petty, and that's why I think me and Floyd Mayweather are best friends because he is the ultimate pettiest person. If you meet him personally, like there's this image of him out there, and this is why I res he resonates so much with me. There's this image that we all have of Floyd from what you <coughs> heard in the headline, or Money Pretty Boy Floyd, or Money Team, or it's all about money, 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 money. But like he's a he's like a big kid, a good dad, and he's just a really genuine, genuinely good person. But he's super petty, right? 
So I used to be, and I'm still infatuated with Beyonce. I think she's the greatest artist alive. I mean, she's everything, right? And I was a huge fan, huge fan. Met her several times. And, but the times I would meet her would be like photo ops or like hi, you know, or like passing at a party, but like you don't look Beyonce in the eyes, you don't talk to her. She's just, <laughs> she's just a mythical creature. Like she just walks by and you just, you glance at her, but you just leave her alone, you know? Um, but I had met everybody. I talked to Michael Jackson. I met Prince. I've met Whitney Houston. I met all the greats, Madonna's, all that. But like Beyonce is a different thing for me. So one day I was um, at a brunch. I tricked, uh, no, I won't say I tricked. I finessed uh, a business uh, person of mine, a business friend of mine, to, to buy a table at the Rock Nation brunch for like $30,000 or something. I'm like, yo, you got to be in that room. Like everybody's going to be there, Jay Z, all that. He wasn't a big Beyonce fan, but his. His girlfriend was, and I was like, Beyonce's gonna be there. You gotta make him cut that check. He cut the check. I went as his plus one. We had our little area. We were there all day. And I remember all day just walking around looking at everybody um, and looking for Beyonce. She wasn't there. I'm like, damn, she's not coming. So this was a waste of our time. So we, we were getting ready to leave. And then right when we walk all the way out the door, we, I see Julius, her security. So I'm like, oh, I'm going back inside. Because if Julius is here, that means Beyonce's coming. He's like, she's not here. It's 4.30. The event's over in 30 minutes. I'm like, if Julius is here, long story short, I go back in. They leave. Door, or, literally, the door opens. I think there were harps playing. There was <laughs> smoke or whatever. And like Beyonce floats in, right? So I see this Indian guy. And he's like, yo. He goes, I want a picture of Jay-Z. I said, I want a picture of Beyonce. So like, his name is Indian Teddy Bear on Instagram. That's all I remember. Because he, I said... I said, I'm going to take your picture with Jay-Z, but you got to help me get this picture with Beyonce, but I don't know how we're going to do it because they don't let you get up on her like that. So when she walked in, I saw that she hugged Jay and she looked over and she goes, oh, that's Hollywood Unlocked. And so then I knew, oh, well, then she knows who I am. Take his picture with Jay-Z. I run. Now, mind you, at the time, 323 pounds, <laughs> running through this thing um, around the corner because I knew where Jay-Z's seat was and I knew where they were going. They were going to land there. So I was waiting at the end and here comes Beyonce. I'm telling you all this because you can go look at it on YouTube. <laughs> I told him, film me saying hello to Beyonce because I want this moment because I'm going to have my moment. And I go up to her and I talk, hey, B, I got to get a photo with you. She's like, yeah, sure. We take three photos. She doesn't like the first one. She's like, no, 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 let's do it again. We take it whatever. I said, thank you so much. Love you, whatever. I leave. So I had gotten to this huge fight with Nicki Minaj. Her fans are literally a terrorist group. <laughs> <laughs> they take my video of my moment meeting Beyonce. Have you seen it? See what I mean? She, <laughs> see? They take this video moment, this moment of me be meeting Beyonce, and they edit it and, it and they say, Beyonce running from Jason Lee. And it becomes this viral thing where literally online, everybody believes that Beyonce ran from me. Now, of course, what, what I didn't even know subconsciously, that made me just stop talking about how much I love Beyonce. So I stopped talking about Beyonce. I just never really talked about her anymore. And then I became friends with Rihanna, started start talking a lot about Rihanna. And then um, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to fix this. So I bought some tickets to go see Beyonce at the Renaissance Tour for me and Tiffany. Yep, recently. But I bought them on the wrong side. So we didn't get a video with Beyonce. So I had to buy more $4,000 tickets to go to Seattle to city. get on the right side to get my moment. And so when she saw me, she blew a kiss to me and said she loved me. And I put that online. I'm like, now eat that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, like, that's the way I handle it now. Because what are you going to do? Go online and say Beyonce wasn't running from you? Like, I learned a long time ago when I was a foster kid with a crackhead mom to a person who saw his brother get his brains blown out, who had to tell, run into everybody who wanted to have that conversation to a person who worked through writing a book about being molested to explain that, to explain what coming out was when I never came out. Like, I don't need to make an announcement that I'm gay. It is what it, I'm not sleeping with you. You don't need to be in my business. Um, I've always had people try to control my narrative. So I'm learning, like, navigating through this world that, like, there's creative ways of controlling the narrative. But it starts with, like, self-control and discipline, which is what we've been working on. I haven't drank in 60 days because I said I want to stop. So I stopped. Now, I would typically celebrate that by drinking, but I'm not going to. <laughs> you know, and then I think we just had our first session with somebody I'm talking to, who, by the way, I'm talking to a crip. Now, here's the deal. I don't judge nobody where they start, because where you start ain't where you're going to end up. Which is the whole reason you're here. Which is why I'm here. And, but I call him Crip Bay now, so all my fans know that I'm, dating, I'm talking to a crip. 
So every time I go online, they're like, where's CritBay? So um, yeah, interesting journey. Um, not perfect, but um, also not really worried about judgment. Like I'm happy I'm living the life I want. And now um, my friend back there, I'm gonna shout them out, Booty and Sixto. Sixto raised like $50 million. He's a former foster kid to help foster kids and foster care legislation. And, and we just had a meeting at my house because they're helping me raise 50 million of my own dollars so that way I can help more kids in my foundation. But you know, like, who knew that being a foster kid, I would lead me on a journey to meeting somebody who was a foster kid who we're both in the same space now wanting to use our platforms to help others. But in terms of manifestation, I really believe in God and I believe that like everything I've gone through, my book is called God Must Have Forgotten About Me. Um, because we all think like, damn, God, like, can I get a break? Like, what's up, God? You know, what's up, what's up? But then, you know, you realize like he gives the greatest test to people to um, push them to their limits to show you like you can triumph over those trials. And I, I've just gone through mine and I'm sure I'll have more. Uh, but, you know, I've been through the worst. So I'm like, come on, let's go. One more question I have. And then if you're willing, they're yeah, going to ask you some questions. Um, we were just having a conversation about people being resourceful. And your success and your ability to achieve things in your life isn't really a coincidence because one of the things that I think speaks the most about how you got to where you got is how when you were young, how you got on the phone with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. uh, would you share that story? Yeah. About, so you got to hear this because <laughs> this is a person. He just manifests things. And you can easily be like, well, he's Jason Lee, so we can do this. But he was like 15. Yeah. And figured out a way to get Michael Jackson on the phone, would you? So I come home. So when I was in foster care, I used to watch Michael all the time. Michael, and my first movie I ever remember watching was Purple Rain. So I have an affection for Prince, met him several times, whatever. But Michael was like, Michael was just like a big source of inspiration as I was a kid. I used to have my little patent leather Stacey Adams. I used to dance thinking I was Michael, but I dressed up as Prince for Halloween because I looked like him. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was a huge fan, a huge fan of Michael. Um, big, big fan. So when I was in the foster home, no, group home, I remember one day, um, and everything that I've ever been through that I write about in the book, and the reason why I wrote the book early, people were like, oh, you wrote the book too soon. Like, wait till your platform is bigger. I'm like, I'm going through my healing process now where I'm gonna put all my shit on paper and let it live there and let that serve as something to help other people. Like I'm not living in this no more. I'm not talking about it in detail anymore. I'm gonna put it in the book. And so um, when I was in uh, the group home, I remember one day waking up and I was on my way to school and I heard on the radio that a man had come to a school in my community that I knew was predominantly an Asian attended school and he, he blew up his car and when all the kids ran out on the playground, he shot him with AK-47, killed all his slaughtered all these children and teachers, uh, shot like 35 people, killed like seven people, whatever, and then killed himself. His name was Patrick Purdy. I was 10, I was 10 at the time. And uh, I'm like, wow, that's crazy. As a kid, 10, you know, I didn't know what school shootings were. We didn't have social media. This was like newspaper news, radio stuff. So um, we come home, we sit at the table with the counselors, they process it. Yes, all these kids were murdered. Yes, 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 whatever. All of us didn't want to go to school because we, like, we were like, we don't want to get killed. This is crazy. So after about a week of us all not going to school and then finally going back to school, while I was getting ready for school, I heard on the radio, oh, Michael Jackson's reportedly come into town to go meet with the kids at the school. We're like, what? This sounds ridiculous. So everybody cut school to try to go see. And Michael Jackson did come. But he came to the school to tell all the kids, like, God, your God is your savior, whatever you're gonna be, you're, you know, he protected you, you're here, you have a purpose, your life has purpose, you're gonna be okay. Went to the hospital, met with all the kids, paid for all the funerals, paid for all the medical bills, did all that. Snuck in, and tried, snuck in and tried to sneak out. But what I learned from all that early on was like, damn, like you have to really love people to not, not know them and want to help in some way. Like I, that was my first um, experience of compassion. Like that, that to me was a definition of compassion. Like he didn't have to do that. But what he did was so greater than probably what his intention was because it did a lot for our community. So I always wanted to meet him for that. Like I just want to meet him. Like that, was, like that made him a bigger star than he already was. So when I came home, I was like, okay, well, I'm home. Um, I went to the fair. I, I wanted to meet Queen Latifah. Uh, I hopped over the gate, lied to the people about somebody taking my pass. They gave me a backstage pass, got up on her, started talking shit to her. I was like, give me a phone number. She was How like, old are you at this time? 15. She was like, I'm not giving you my phone number. And I said, that's because you think you better than me. You the queen. <laughs> um, and uh, so she, she was like, yo, this, this dude is crazy. You know, and we get to talking. And she said, if it's meant to be, you'll find me. So, she gave, so whatever. I ended up finding her. Got shot three days later in the hospital, called her. Found her. 
So when I start, I just always believe like anything is possible. Like I said to Queen Latifah, I want your number. She said, if it's meant to be, you'll find me. I got shot. I'm in the hospital. I call 411. I get living single. I get Queen Latifah on the phone. I get her phone number. I go to see her. Now I'm just applying it to everything. I want anybody I want to meet. So like I, I remember I, I want to meet Michael. So I bought a tape. I found his record label. I called 411, got the number. I asked to speak to his assistant because I'm assuming that's who would talk to him the most. She, her name was Evie. She got on the phone and I, and I told her like, yeah, I want to meet Michael. I'm from Stockton. He came, but blah, blah. So uh, I said, she said, okay, I'll give him a message. I said, okay, she's not going to do it. So I'm going to call her every day. So I called her every day. Evie, what you doing? What you eating for lunch? You talk to Mike, Mike call back. Mike going to call me. And I ran up my aunt's phone bill and she was so mad at me, but I called, called, called. And then one day um, he called me back and we had a moment. No. <laughs> The reason why I now, think, if I could turn that into a Miss Cleo business, like <laughs> I would be cleaning it up. I think you're doing fine. But the reason I think that's so important is you hear what he just said. I just think anything is possible. Having gone through everything he's gone through, like he lives his life as if anything is possible. But the stuff I go after is always the stuff that is looked at as impossible. I'm on MTV, wildin' out. I'm on VH1, loving hip hop. I'm on BET, the games people play, playing myself. That's all Viacom. Viacom is a network owned by a white woman that targets black people, those networks. But I'm on there, getting paid pennies, by the way, and making to be a fool on one network, being praised on another, and wanted to go to the award show, the VMAs, and they told me no. So when they told me no, I said, well, then I'm gonna create my own award show. Like, that sounds so stupid. Stupid and crazy for a, so for somebody just out the blue to go, I'm gonna just create my own award show. And then when I said it, and I said it publicly, I'm like, now I gotta actually do it. Okay, how much is that? How much that cost? And they're like, 700 grand. Okay, well, so the so I pay for it out of my own pocket the first year. Last year was 900 grand, pay for my own thing. But the last year, you know, I started calling people, okay, what I, I, I realized I was just telling them in this meeting we had, like, my hardest thing is I don't know how to raise money, but I do have all the contacts if I needed to raise money, but I'm afraid to ask for money. That's one thing I'm afraid of, because I just, if you tell me no, then don't ever call me again. <laughs> but, but I have mastered leveraging, right? So, like, I called Madonna to be a part of my award show last year. She said she was too busy. I said, okay, I knew, she, you know, maybe her and Mariah Carey aren't the best of friends, so I called Mariah Carey. And then Mariah Carey said yes, and I called Madonna and said, don't worry about it, Mariah's going to do it. You know, petty. Uh, right. So <laughs> I learned how to leverage, right? And now we have this amazing award show. And it's like, it's black owned, it's for the culture. It's, and it's, we had the vice president pull up uh, on a video with us last year. We had Babyface and Whoopi Goldberg. Last year we had Mariah Carey and Lizzo and Tiffany hosted both the years, and now it's turned into an actual show that'll be televised. And so I just know, like, if you, you know, I say I love Rihanna, become friends with Rihanna. I say I want to be on The Breakfast Club, now I'm co host of Breakfast Club. So like, I just feel like if you want it bad enough, and you just do everything with the right intentions, like, if you put in the work, eventually it's gonna happen. And um, so, yeah. I, but that to me is what's incredible, right? Is like, if we can manifest those things, then our clients who have depression, they can manifest happiness, or they, because he says ridiculous things. Like, I'm gonna host my own award show. I'm gonna pay for it out of my own pocket. And like he said, like Babyface was there. It was good. Um, the twins, the, uh, not the two oh, sisters. Oh, Hallie and Chloe and Hallie. Chloe and Hallie, yeah. I mean, it was. It was good. It was amazing, it was absolutely amazing. You, you've been on the pivot, like you, everything he says, he just, remember yesterday I was talking to Tiffany about like, there's a thing that people have that helps them achieve where they don't see the obstacles and he does not but see that's the thing on some like again the meeting that we were just in like fundraising is like asking people for my talking about money is um is uncomfortable for me only because when i talk to certain <laughs> people you're i always feel like if a person doesn't respond with the amount that i'm asking for then you don't see the value and then that becomes a whole other moment because um I don't come at a discount. Mm -hmm. I've been asked to be discounted so many times. Like, oh, you know, especially, and they come from our people the most. Oh, yeah, you, you know, you know. What? What? <laughs> because my rent don't say, you know, you know. <laughs> For real. Like, my travel doesn't say, you know, you know. I posted on Facebook yesterday, and people, 
I don't know, I don't even think about how people are gonna perceive what I post because I really don't care. But I said last month, I didn't drink, I stopped going out, I didn't really do excess shopping, I didn't take all my friends on a trip, and I saved in one month $243,000. That's a lot of money. That foster kid who didn't have no home and didn't have no money knew what $100 felt like. And so that was a reality check for me that like to squander 200, not squander, but you know, to unnecessarily spend a quarter of a million dollars when that could be investing in jobs or things that help me grow beyond where I am now. Like it's a, it's a level check for me to go like, I didn't need to do that or hire somebody to help me raise money. You know what I mean? Um, and so I think it's just one of those things where like, I'm constantly in a battle with myself to improve in certain areas. But you know, the will to live, the will to survive, the will to want to be better, the want, will to want to be great, that is something that I've always had um, and I've, I haven't always perfected because I have allowed distractions you know, from people or things, but like now I'm locked in because uh, now I realize, um, like Queen Latifah told me, she said, to whom much is given, much is required. You are now the person that that foster kid is looking at as an example, that that person whose mother's on drugs or person whose father abandoned him um, uh, and there's one little quick story. We were on The Breakfast Club, and he was there, and me and Charlamagne and D Envy were interviewing him, and we were to start talking about our fathers, and, and, and I would say, you know, what do you think about people being guilted into, like, having a relationship with their dad? Because I don't have one with mine, not because he's not present. I chose to vacate the relationship. I chose to uh, put it into it years ago. Uh, it's not, there's no negative feelings. I'm not mad, I'm not bitter. I just don't communicate with him and, and you know and everybody says I should build a relationship with him because he's gonna die <clears throat> soon because he's older uh, he was like 72 and uh, I, I said I don't feel a need to build that relationship like I, the relationship to me has already died to me uh, and we had that conversation and then two days later he died and then uh, here come everybody with the guilt oh you don't feel guilty you don't see, you living with guilt I give closure to myself I release I give myself the license to let go and the permission to have peace over everything, finances, people, friends. If you want to cross me and betray me, not a problem. Good luck and Godspeed. Because I know the value that, that, that depletes from your life when I remove myself. And so I don't need to, and that's not an ego thing. That's just a, like, I know how many times I paid for dinner thing. I know how many times you slept in my house for free thing. I know how many trips you've been on for free thing. I know how many relationships you've used for me or that you benefited from. So I know that. And uh, when he died, I had no, there was, and still to this day, I had no feeling about it. I, it didn't hurt. I sent flowers. I sent a card. I checked on every one of my siblings to make sure that they were okay, let them know I was there for them. But I didn't feel the need to like be guilted into a relationship with him. Uh, the same with my mom as she was dying. I wrote in the book. Um, she had asked for, she started crying, you know, literally crying. And uh, she was in the hospital and she said, I just need, need to know that you forgive me. I, and I knew at that moment that forgiveness was for me but that she needed that piece to go and she died the next day. I, I'm fine with all that. And I don't even think we've talked about it in therapy because mm -hmm. I really have given myself the closure uh, and, and I'm good. But I think a lot of people that are just like, they have a lot going on. It's, I, don't, I, I just pray they find the ability to slow down enough to like gather the thought on how to work on it in increments. Like you can't work on everything at all the time. Like you just can't. Like there's, when we started, I was drinking every day. A lot. I loved it, you know? <laughs> but then when you think about it, like everything I'm ever doing wrong is when I'm drunk. Every, spending all the money, every time I go into a financial conversation with my CFO, it's marketing, but no, nah, that was a lot of alcohol, okay. Or trips, random trips, and 10 people going to Dubai. Like, there's no reason why 10 people need to fly business class to Dubai, because those 10 people wouldn't take me to Dubai. So yeah, a lot of a um, lot of aha moments, but um, that two hundred forty-three thousand. I don't know. I'm gonna cut this week. This month, I'm cut next month. It's more. Any questions for Jason? Yeah, I have a microphone. <coughs> I have. Wait for the microphone. Oh. Yeah, Thank you for coming and sharing with us. I mean, you're really an inspiration. Your story is. When did you? You said the will to be great. And you had 15, you were confronting the queen and calling Michael Jack. You know, when did you, what age were you when you realized you had that capacity mm -hmm. to be great? I think when I came home from foster care and realized that although my mother wasn't on drugs, but she was still a mess, like I was like, this is not, I don't want to do this. Like we were living in another man's house who I didn't know was her friend, but it was like a nice house, but it was still like, it was still around a stranger. I had just come out of five years of stranger care. Like I don't, I don't 
want to do that. I don't, I don't see her um, being able to do more for me, so I got to do more for me. Um, I said early on, like, I'm never going to do drugs. I didn't even think alcohol was a drug until I really got into it. But I, I was like, I'm never going to do crack, heroin, pills, meth, all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I, I, I figured out that I wanted to be great. But then I started, like, I got shot at 15, didn't die. Oh, damn, I'm indestructible. That gave me a whole different level of energy. Like, man, they try to take me out. I'm, I'm still here. Um, and then it was lots of take me out, still here, take me out, still here. Oh, okay, cool, kicked out of school, take my GED, I'm still here. Go to college, oh, kick me out of college, okay, I'm still here. I, I just kept surviving everything. Um, and then when my brother died at 19, that was like, that was, now that was a test because that one almost took me out. Um, but to go through it and come on the other side of it and still have all my faculties and still be like, not have, because I had the depression and the breakdown and the, Falling to the knees and all that kind of thing, but like, once I survived and worked through that, um, I saw this episode on Oprah where Dr. Phil and her were helping a woman whose kid had been murdered at 19, at 18, and uh, Oprah said, "Okay, now that you told your daughter's story, what are you going to do?" She said, "I was going to go home and kill myself. This, the goal was to come here and tell her story." And Dr. Phil looked at her and said, "Why are you choosing to live? Why are you choosing to live in the one moment your daughter died and not celebrate the 18 years she lived?" I was like, oh, I gotta, I gotta celebrate all these years that I'm living. Mm -hmm. So every day that I'm awake, I'm just trying to be better. Uh, and and when I'm not, I just you know, pivot and figure it out the next day. So I was still around 15 when I knew like I wanted a better life, and then boom, just kept going. Wait for the mic. Oh, me first. Well, hi. Thank you so hi. much for being here. I'm yes. Jason. Um, kind of a two-part question. How do you think um, your experiences in foster care system really prepared you in your career? And then the second one, you seem to have a real strong belief and faith in God. Mm -hmm. How come? It's a lot of things to believe and to really be into here in California and Hollywood. Why that? Um, I know for a fact, okay, in my book I write about the Easter family, which ironically the mother, the foster mother, Elnora Easter, her birthday is today, she, um, they brought me in their home, they taught me, first of all, if anytime you go into a foster home with a parent where the father is a pastor and the mother is the first lady, you're going to church every day. These people, they should go to jail for that, by the way. <laughs> I went to church every day. I mean, Bible study. I learned every book of the Bible. Choir practice. I couldn't sing, but I was singing. Uh, <laughs> prayer service. Uh, Sunday school. Uh, I mean, I mean, we, was in, we were in church. But what I loved about church, what I fell in love with church, was gospel music. So, like, gospel music became the ministry that I navigated to. And, yes, he was the best pastor still to this day, and I think T.D. Jakes is the next best, but he was the best. Um, every teaching in the home was about, um, with, of God was just about love. It wasn't like, you know, you got to follow God, because if you don't, you know, people weaponize the Bible, weaponize God. Gays are going to burn it to hell. Well, no, you're going to burn it to hell because the way you slept around on your wife and all these kids you got, but whatever. <laughs> Because even if you lie on your idea about how much you weigh, the Bible says no sin is greater than another. So murder and lying about your weight on that idea, you both are going to hell. <laughs> so um, they were just like really good about teaching me um, God. And then as I started literally like leaning on him, praying, 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 and pray, staying prayered up. And um, uh, then so that's where I got my faith. And then gospel music led me into like, becoming friends with a lot of gospel artists and Karen Clark Sheard and Yolanda Adams and all these different people. And then like talking to them, they minister to me in a different way than it being all biblical, but it's more teachings of like the lessons that the Bible have or whatever. So I have a strong faith in God. Now I will say this, when I wrote my book, um, the title of the book was going to be called Waiting to Die because I felt like that every moment of those times, like, damn, like, I guess I'm just, I'm over this. But then I thought about it. I was like, no, nah, I have a strong faith in God, so I'm going to write a book called God Must Have Forgotten About Me to make people think that it's like Serena Williams to this day won't read my book because she thinks it's anti-God. But I keep trying to tell her, read the book because it's not about that. Like it's it the not. opposite. It is, yes. So that there's that. Um, what was the second question? That was the second question. The first, first question was, how did your experiences in foster care oh. prepare you for your survival. career? Survival. Survival. I hear it. Survival. Um, 
I remember I used to have this um, uh, youth counselor named Johan. Your foster kid never never forgets the good counselors and the bad counselors, or the good foster parents or the bad foster parents. Like you remember everything. Um, but I remember Johan. He every time I would cry or complain about not going home, because my mother would always come and visit me, and then she would leave, and I would be like, "Am I going home?" And she'd be like, "No, I can't take you." So it was like a letdown every time I seen her. And he would say to me. Stop being weak. You're sniveling. Stop being a pussy. This was like grown ass man saying this to a, like a little ten year old, right? But I remember like um, how I felt about that, and I I remember like I did toughen up, although I didn't like how he said it. I did realize like, yo, I gotta be tough because I can control how I deal with the situation. I can't control the situation. So I look at everything now, like when somebody calls, oh, you know, uh, you're not invited to. Um, the NAACP awards. Okay, cool. So then I call Charlemagne and say, Kai, come in on the Breakfast Club. Then I go on the Breakfast Club and I say, um, the NAACP, oh no, can I tell y'all what I really said? <laughs> <laughs> just understand, you it's just online. said yes. It's online. You just said yes. By the way, if you ask people about me when you meet them or like people that know me, they will never tell you that they met this Jason. They won't say that. This is not really a narrative that people say about me. They were like, yo, he crazy, he wild, he messy, he say this and that. And sometimes they're right. But um, <laughs> uh, I went on the Breakfast Club and I said, fuck the NAACP. Fuck them. Because you can't stand for black excellence and black culture and defending blackness, but then you, you, you segregate the culture on the carpet and put white media before black or hire white publicity firms to manage the culture, to gatekeep the culture, to stop us from coming to having real conversations with the people we talk about every day, but praise the people that talk about them once a month. Fuck you, fuck your publicity firm. I mean, I went all the way out. And it became a thing where then, all the black journalists started rallying up behind me, calling out people on the red carpet, and Halle Berry stopped for a black outlet when her white publicist tried to stop her, and then that went viral. And people still today, just the Essence editor talked about it on the Breakfast Club crediting the movement that I started, but it wasn't a movement that I wanted to start. I just wanted to address something head on, loud enough for everybody to hear it, knowing that what? You're not gonna invite me to your award show? Guess what? I already got my own award show. So I don't gotta go. So my team the other day said, can we submit you for NAACP or what? I said, for fun. <laughs> They're not gonna <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> but like, you can submit it for fun, like send them a picture of me going, hey, you know. But um, I don't really care. Like. You know, I know now, like, I do want an Emmy at some point because I know that I'll be able to stand on a stage to say a message to people who believe they would never be able to get there. Like, it's just everything I'm doing now is just to get to a place to say, like, yo, I'm nationally syndicated in 72 markets on iHeart. I'm the first openly gay host in urban radio to do that. So that door has been open now. Okay, while and out. All my jokes, Nick Cannon, are going to be gay. I'm going to kiss somebody on your show. I'm going to be gay every time I come up here because there's somebody gay at home that's never seen a gay joke on while and out saying, damn, now they got this gay nigga up there kissing people. Sorry I said nigga, but that's how I talk. <laughs> um, and, I uh, warned him. Huh? I warned him. Edit out. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, like, I just now, like, I don't know. I had a conversation the other day with this brand. I'm not gonna say the brand because you're filming this, but this man uh, was very, um, he was bothered by the fact that he had to talk to me because he's the number two person at this major, major, major brand. And uh, his boss told him to get on the call with me, but he felt like he was, I felt like he felt like he was above me because he didn't know who I, he was like, why are we on the call? Like, you know, I get so many calls every day, like what, what, what you know? And that's what he said to me. And I just said, to, and in my mind, I, I kept saying, like, we really, this is a multi-million dollar opportunity. Jason, like, don't let yourself down. Come on. I said, okay. First of all, you're not even the right partner for me because I could tell by your attitude that you think you're better than me, but I can look at you and tell you that you're not. I said, the second thing is, you talk about this culture, the culture. Can you tell me what is the culture? Because I've been living it for 46 years and you've been hired to push it for two. I'm not going to waste any more of my time, but yet I'm going to go out and talk about this experience. And I promise you, you better beat me. You better beat me to your board of directors and your upline because they're going to hear it. And he calmed himself down and he said, "Okay, okay, 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 okay." okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we had this whole moment, this whole conversation. And but here's the deal: like I said at the top, I always stay ready. He calmed me down. He said, "We're going to set up another call. We're going to figure this out. We're going to do this, this, and that." I'm not really sure we could do, but we'll figure it out. So that, not sure what we're going to do, I knew it was his way out. The next call, there were three black people on the call with him, and he put them all in front of him to talk to me. 
And I said, and I let them do their best. And, I, and right when I said, are you guys done? I said, let me give you guys a lesson. Mm. Um, back in slavery days, there was a plantation where the house niggas came and handled the rest of us. And that's what you just tried to do. Mm. Now, when I tell you, baby, the commitments they're giving me, the conversations, the, oh my God. No, now they're like, would you come in as a culture consultant? I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. But that's the thing, right? You can't be afraid to lose what you don't got. So I went in already not having it, but knowing the value that I would have coming to it. So like when he was telling me how too busy he was, I said, you know what? You'd want a partnership with J Balvin, Rihanna, Queen Latifah, Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've worked with some of them. I said, I'm going to put them all in a group text and you right now and tell them exactly <laughs> what you did to me. Because you're, you wouldn't talk to them that way because you see the perceived value is what's on the outside. You didn't even give me a chance. But my whole life has been people not giving me a chance. And I'm still going to steamroll right over your ass. And now, now the people who, now it's like a whole thing. Now everybody's just, uh, you know, they're really sensitive about the relationship. But like I tell them, I'm only going to be, um, I'm only going to be the vessel of truth. So whatever the experience is, if it's great, it's going to be great. If it ain't, it's not going to be great. And if I don't get to partner with you, it's your loss. Good. I want to take a question online first, but before I do, what is so wonderful is everything Jason has gone through, he still values himself. Like he knows his worth. We have to treat every client that we see as valuable knowing their worth, even when they don't see it in themselves, right? He has every reason and excuse to devalue himself and never does, never does. Dennis, are there any questions online? All right, we got one question from Lourdes. And the question is, do you know what your destination is? Where do you want to be? Well, I was invited to a trip in the Bahamas today, but I stayed for this. <laughs> <laughs> Which I appreciate. Thank you. It's OK. I've never been either. I'm like, damn, Elliot. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, Keeping your word is important, especially when people didn't keep theirs with you. Like, you have to be the person that you want to attract. You have to be the person that you say you value, right? Um, you know, uh, when people don't take my time uh, seriously or play with my time, that means you don't see my value. So good luck with you. Um, where is my destination? You know, uh, there's this, um, there's this uh, documentary by Warren Buffett, Becoming Warren Buffett, where he talks about like, his career and how he did his investments and all this and that, and how money was never about being the richest man in the world, but he used money as a measurement of success, like how he was able to um, move in certain areas, but then how he gave it all away, which I thought was like the craziest thing. But once you start to make a lot of money, you realize like, to whom much is given, much is required. You do have to use now your platform, your resources to do better for other people because that's the passing of it on. Um, so my destination has been changing. I mean, I'm just trying right now to just be at like the happiest place in my life. So like, I'm not missing alcohol at all. Um, I, he, he, we started with, a, I'm not gonna drink, I'm only gonna do, do one drink. That one drink for me is like, <laughs> that's just like the gateway to get to the second. I, like, I can't drink one drink. I either have to drink no drinks or just drink the whole bar. <laughs> um, and so I just said, I'm just going to stop drinking, and I stopped. And I feel like the destination for me right now is pure happiness, whether it's health, wealth, finances, my business, all my employees, being very clear in my relationships and where I stand with everybody. Um, I didn't just lose physical weight. I cut a lot of friends out. I cut my, a lot of family members out. And it's not, I don't see it as a loss. I literally look at it like it's an increase. Like in order to increase towards the place of happiness, true happiness, I have to be better in all those areas. So I talked about it at my award show. I used to thank God every day on Facebook, thanking God for another day and pray for things. And then I got them all and stopped thanking God. So I had to like reprogram myself to go back to waking up in the morning, go on my Facebook, thanking God, asking people what they're thankful for, creating a space of positive energy. But the destination for me is just happiness. And what that looks like to me is just um, health, wealth, uh, making sure my finances are great and all the energy around me is positive and that we all align uh, um, and that mediocrity is not acceptable in any way uh, with anybody around me, so, yeah. I love it. Um, Jazz. Said that you, I was gonna meet you, was like, oh my God, and like, 
I know who you are, but I've never watched anything you do. So I feel like you are extremely authentic, but I'm getting like a very, very, very raw form of authenticity right now with very. you. And <laughs> no, like, like when I told you, if you asked me if Sue was cute, I would tell you no. <laughs> and, and I'll do that too, though. I'd be like, don't ask. Mom. My favorite actress in the world is Angela Bassett. Love her to death. We have the same birthday. She love her, everything about her. Um, we wanted to honor Angela at the award show uh, this year. She couldn't make it. I'm at a, a, a fashion show. She was walking in. I'm like, oh my God, here comes Angela Bassett. And I had met her a few times, but it, again, in passing. And I said, oh my God, Angela. And she goes, oh, she goes, I know you wanted to honor me at your award show. I said, you know who I am? She's like, of course I know who you are. I heard you, but I'm not going to be in town. I said, yeah. I said, I just want to tell you, like, I love you. I'm a fan. Like, you're my favorite. She goes, are you lying? I said, if I didn't like you, I would tell you to your face. She was like, to my face? Yes, that's just who I am. <laughs> but, what, but, but see, that gets labeled messy. That's not really messy. Honesty saves us all time. If you know you don't want to meet with me, if you know you don't want to partner with me, if you know you don't want to hire me, and if you know you don't like my energy, why play with me? Why send several emails and phone calls and text messages? Because that's a text and a call that you can give to some other energy that's going to give you what you want. Right. So like when somebody said to me in the airport the other day for the first time, can I get a picture with you? I did not have my hair comb. <laughs> I was looking crazy. I had not gotten good sleep on the flight. And I said, and I, and I remember saying, here it comes. No. But I remember I never said no to a fan. And I was waiting to see her reaction because she had built up how big of a fan she was. She had her phone out. Her husband was ready to take the phone and everything. And I said, look, my hair is not comb. I ain't feeling it today. And, but we had a whole conversation. But I felt no. And I, I was proud of myself. Because that was a boundary that most people won't say. Now, I'm not going to do it too often because that's just rude, but yeah. Um, so Some people will say I'm messy. When you go back and tell them, they're going to be like, he messy, huh? I'll be like, yep. But, does it, but the cool, do you guys experience him as messy? No. Just a really strong, authentic person. And he earned his authentic, authenticity. Telling somebody their baby is ugly is, could be messy. Well. <laughs> but the, but be care, don't ask a question you don't want the truth. There you go. <laughs> Um, so you said earlier, if you can't digest me, then like we aren't meant to connect and like that's just, yeah. and like I really liked that, but um, while you were coming up and building your brand and everything, did you ever get in positions like where you felt like you did, like you, you stayed around with people that couldn't digest you and then you realized or from like the rip you were just like, no, it's okay. <laughs> I will say like when I did Love and Hip Hop, I stayed in it too long. I stayed in it too long because there were no doors open for me. And I'm gonna share something with you. So like Queen Latifah, like again, I've known her 30 years. This woman, I've known her longer than anybody literally in my life right now. Cause my first boyfriend was at 28, 20 years ago and we're still best friends, but like she was my, the person. So over the years, she's never been on my show. She's never showed up at my award show. She's never retweeted anything I've done. She, but she's, you know, but she sees my, my camera on carpet. She'll give shout outs and she'll say hi to me or whatever. And you know, whatever, it's love. And we can, she responds to me, but she didn't show up for me the way I wanted her to. And I remember when, I, when Love & Hip Hop came around, the opportunity to go on and promote Hollywood Unlocked that I just started, I went to her and she said, don't do it. Like, you're better than that, you know, but like, you're not gonna open the door for me. Mm -hmm. Floyd Mayweather said, do it. The only three type of people that'll tell you not to do it are people who have money like me that don't need it, people who don't have the talent, and people who don't want you to have the opportunity. Just do it. Mm -hmm. And I did it, and it worked for me. And so, but when I got in it, and I knew it wasn't working for me, I kept trying to make excuses and making pivots on making it work, and I did, but it was like so much damage caused that I had to work so much more outside of the show to make it work that um, I just wish maybe like, I wish there would have been other opportunities, but I don't regret that I went through it, but yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. I, don't, I try not to live with regrets because every lesson I've ever had, every good or bad thing has been a great opportunity for me to grow. Yeah. And then we'll take another one online. Dennis. Dennis, get another question after this one. After this one. Okay, hi. Okay. okay, so you had talked about like you were in survival mode, right? Yeah. You were always in survival mode. So I'm wondering, I kind of have two questions. How are you able to identify your purpose while being in survival mode? Because we know that when you're in survival mode, you're just trying to get through the day. You can't really, you're not looking at the bigger picture. You're just yeah. trying to get through the day. So how were you able to identify your purpose in that? And also my last question is, at what point were you like, all right, now I can live, now I can enjoy. I don't have to be on survival mode anymore. I, I'm not there. I'm, I'm in still in survival mode. Um, Cause it's just, survival mode is not, you're not always like surviving being chased by a wild boar. You know, like survival mode for me is, 
I have 12 employees that I got to make sure stay employed in an ever-changing climate with advertising, COVID, changing of the this or that. Okay, um, so like it's like surviving for me is like just navigating, right? Um, the survival mode, because like when I was in foster homes and group homes, I always had three meals a day. I always had clothes. I always had shelter and a bed. So it wasn't like I was sleeping in a homeless encampment or uh, those those type of things. Um, survival for survival for me was really about like a mentality, you know. And like right now, my survival is okay. Um, I got to make four million dollars in three months in order to hit a certain goal for next year and at first i wanted to go crazy because that's crazy but then i have to like sit down map it out structure my thoughts and time okay my meetings i'm no longer doing 30 minute meetings 15 minute meetings and we're done um who, rob i'm not going to these meetings every day anymore you're going to do those okay andrew you're now going to go to miami five days a week and manage this like it's if survival that's what survival is for me now the purpose work for me Hollywood Unlock is not my purpose, it's my passion. So my passion became Hollywood Unlock, passion Hollywood Unlock, Hollywood Unlock. Once I wrote my book and I put it out, I knew that I poured everything into it because it's the most truest, rawest, like most honest thing I ever done. Uh, and I remember right, and I put everybody's name in the book and everybody was like, well, you're not supposed to do that. You can get sued. Well, sue me. Guess what? That deposition is going to be crazy because I'm going <laughs> to, your shit's going to be book number two, right? <laughs> So, um, so when I put the when I put the book out, and I saw like young kids going on YouTube coming out gay, saying I read Jason's book crying, saying they wanted to come out, or parents flooding my comments saying my kid is gay, and this helped me have a conversation with my kid, or a foster kid saying, hey, can you mentor me online because I'm a foster kid coming out of foster care and don't have a plan, but how did you do it? Like I started seeing, oh wow, like there's actual people who don't know the answers to what in my mind are just the easiest thing, because I did it, like I just did it. Like when you ask me how I did it, I don't know, I just did it. When you don't have shit, you don't have a bunch of reasons why not to do it. You either do it or you don't. You either do it or you don't, it's like going to school. You either fight the bully and beat him up or you get beat up every day. I'ma choose to beat him up. So I beat him up and they stopped bullying me. That's a real story too. Um, yeah, survival, it was just a thing where like I, I had to do it, but as I built my platform and I started seeing like, yo, we're reaching people in Africa. We're reaching people in, in London. I'm going to Dubai. As soon as I get off a plane, they know me in Dubai. Okay, I have a platform. How do I use that? What's the purpose in the platform? That's my foundation. That's what we're meeting about today before we came here. The purpose work is now being able to launch Hollywood Cares, uh, my nonprofit, being able to target black and brown kids in communities, starting with my own and then piloting it there and growing it around the nation. So that way we can actually give people the skills and storytelling like what I'm saying today. Uh, we had a workshop with 300 kids last weekend and the mayor was there trying to talk to these kids and he was talking to them like a mayor talks. And he was talking about um, how uh, the funding we're going for was being blocked by the city manager. They don't understand, they're not civically engaged so they don't understand how city government works. So I said to them, think about it like this, the mayor is your mom. The city council member sitting over here, I mean the dad, the dad. The, the woman over here, the city council member, Padilla, she's your mother. Mom and dad and all of us want to go to Great America. We're all ready to go to Great America. We're all prepared for this road trip. But the city manager is hating ass grandma. Grandma don't want us to be great. So grandma just told us we can't go, now the trip is canceled. How does that feel? Oh, we hate grandma. We hate the city manager. <laughs> but that's literally how I educated these kids. But those are you know, conversations we want to dumb down for the sake of educating the younger people because they are the people that's going to reshape the world that we live in. And so what we were talking about is what does that look like and how do we scale and how do we get it to where, I mean, and I'm, and I'm using every phone number I got from the vice president to the DNC to my friends over there to everybody to say, hey, I know for sure that when I sat in my studio apartment and dreamt of Hollywood Unlocked with an Instagram and a hundred dollar bill, that's literally all I had. Me and my friend were literally saying, we're going to go buy some Top Ramen noodles. We're going to walk to the club because we can't buy gas. We're going to get this free clothes from Fashion Nova. Like, we're going to get out here and fake it till we make it. We're going to hustle it up. And then I started a company that's worth $50 million now. So I know that I've already proven to myself and others I know how to build companies and scale. I just need to figure out the right avenue to do that. And that's the purpose work because then I'll feel like, everything I went through was worth it. When you know, when a person comes up to you and says, oh, you literally changed my life. And I have people say that, different iterations of that every day. You know, oh, I read your book and that changed how I thought about gay people or I changed, 
or even having a rapper on my show this week talking about uh, him telling his son he's gay online and the millions of comments that come out of that and me explaining to him kids getting bullied and killing themselves for being called gay at school and having a moment where somebody in hip hop connected and now looking at all the comments online where people are getting it. Like, I know that's the purpose. So hopefully we're able to do the work with the foundation and, um, you know, get there. Dennis? All right, we have a question online from Petia, which says, what achievement in your life are you most proud of? Um, you know, I, I like to think that like I've made my brother proud hmm. because I think that was the one time that I've said, and, and the reason why I hold Queen Latifah so high, by the way, she followed me on Instagram today. <laughs> took her 30 years. I don't understand this woman. Good. Um, when I think about my reverence for her is because when he did die, suicide was a thought. I mean, it wasn't like a plan. I wasn't like Jada Pinkett riding around looking at the mountains to drive off of, which by the way, she's a hot ass mess. Y'all need to go, y'all need, <laughs> need to go find Will and Jada for real. Just take her phone from her. Cause if she tweet one more thing about alopecia. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the authorities on her. <laughs> but I did buy her book though. Cause I want to read the details. No, so like, like, I think for me, the proudest moment is like being able to collect myself and not lose it. Uh, there's a story in my book where when my brother died, I really thought like, this is it. I'm going to just die. Like, and I want everybody around me and him who did anything to him to die. My brother, Chris, I think he took advantage of my weakness. And this was another lesson. Everything I've been through, I really try to pay attention to the lesson at all. My brother knew that I was weak and he knew that I was... Um, gullible and would do anything because I was being reckless and he calls me and he says I know somebody that robbed our brother and I said who and he told me who so I called my friend one who was in the military one who was just a regular guy I went to school with and I'm like yo get uh, my brother we got my brother's guns we're gonna go to this place we're gonna go kill this guy who robbed my brother so my friend Miles who's like what like we're gonna do what <laughs> It's not funny, but, but if, if you can see Miles, like this little frog guy, he's like, we're going to do what? And I'm like, you, you can drive, because clearly, you <laughs> clearly you're not going to be able to shoot. You're going to drive the car. So Miles drives the car, and we go there, and I'm like, you wait outside, don't leave. We go in, we put these hoodies on and these masks, and we literally are going in with the intention to kill this person. I, and I remember saying to my, I remember thinking, I wrote in the book, that I was so full of rage that whoever opened the door, we were just gonna kill him. Kid, mother, father, grandmother, wheelchair, not baby, whoever, we gonna kill whoever's in that house and whoever opens that door, because that's how much rage I had at the time. And uh, I remember us looking back now, so crazy, walking through this apartment building with the lights on in the evening, who anybody could have just walked out of these guys walking with hoodies and masks on with these guns. Um, it could have just been a mess, right? But nobody came out and I knocked on the door and I remember we pointed the guns at the door and we were ready. I mean, and the adrenaline rush of like knowing that you're getting ready to just start shooting a person, like the craziest thing. Nobody opened the door. And, I, and so when I write the book, God must have forgotten about me. All the lessons is like, could you imagine had that door open? I wouldn't be sitting here right now. So, so the one thing that I'm proud of is that I worked through all that shit. I mean, I, we did other things to hurt other people, but you know, I realized none of that made me feel better. But what made me feel better was that I was able to pick myself up and keep moving. And so now when I get all the accolades or when I even have in this moment being able to tell my brother's story, I'm like, yo, I know for sure that my life has purpose to it. Like all the little red carpet shit, the, oh, you, you're over here with Rihanna and over here on this talk show and in this photo show. Oh yeah, that's great, that's great. Um, but when I know for a fact that everything was stacked against me to get here that in it and in spite of it all i'm still here and i'm just barely getting started like yeah like I, I think that's the thing i'm the most proud of for sure one more question dixie my question is just thank you so much for coming hold on wait wait for the microphone wait for the microphone thank you so much for coming today and you just said i've come from a background where it seems like I'm in the medical field, I'm a nurse, but people are very transactional. And you were talking about how your meetings are now 15 minutes. So you're, you're giving us this great gift today, like you're sitting here with us for this long period of time and sharing your story and just really opening up to us. Why? What's the motivation? I could ask that of everybody who well, came well, to talk to us. I love telling stories. Story about a nurse. 
So <laughs> <laughs> I've lived many lives. I say I was a union rep, right? So I worked for SEIU, UHW, representing like lab assistants, uh, LVNs, medical assistants. But then when we end up leaving that, I end up going to work for California Nurse Association. And I remember my first day walking into a hospital in Southern California, Olympic Medical Center, talking to uh, nurses about a strike I wanted to take them on. And having to talk to a critical care nurse about walking out on their patients was like the hardest thing in the world because nurses are in the business of caring for people who can't care for themselves and nurses love their patients. That's a job that I know for sure those people are underpaid, undervalued, and they don't do it with the gratitude they deserve and they do it because they care. Like I know that because I've talked to thousands of nurses now. Um, but what I learned for sure was the importance of building trust and time. And, and, and I know that time is limited. Like all of us are on a clock. We don't know when that clock is gonna stop. Um, but I know that whenever we're in a space to give uh, ourselves the best version of ourselves to give impact is important. He gives me that time, that time, uh, this is time well spent because I feel like these are conversations that matter. Now I will tell you, there are lots of times that people will have conversations with me that things that don't matter. And they may get a different experience with me because I am quick to cut that off. Like I don't want to talk about who had the best outfit, who had the best clothes, who had the best song. All of his trash is on TikTok. Go listen to it. What's what are we talking about? Um, and um, yeah, I just you know I hope that um, in sharing space with people that it it just makes the day better. But it's gonna be honest for real. Whether it's better for you or not, it's better for me because I'm gonna keep it real. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, to to take that a step further, like I I want you to know how much I appreciate it. Like um, I just mentioned it to him and he said yes and a, a thing you guys should know about Jason which you've probably already picked up he doesn't do anything he doesn't choose to do people do not force Jason Lee to do anything um so this was totally out of his out of his generous out of his own heart so Jason man thank you <laughs> <laughs>